There was a minister that came to our, our German English church when I was in Germany. Prophetic minister, played the piano, sang, just awesome. He connected with me, and I'm like, wow, the favor of God. And, and he said, why don't you come to my apartment? Let's pray. And so I went over to his apartment. We prayed a little bit, and it was just, a, it was weird. It was like, uh, without getting into too many details, it's like taking a shower with your socks on. Just the prayer felt off. I, I couldn't put my finger on why. But in the midst of the prayer, he's like, we just need to make a covenant together. I'm young. I'm in my 20s. I just met you, dude. And and. Anyway, I do it. I'm, I'm a little naive. And the next thing I know, I get an email from Susan. She said, hey, I just had a dream about you making a covenant with somebody that's improper. I'm like, whoa. And you're like, man, I wish I had a personal profit on the side. Look, I don't know how that happened. But I'm like, God, what do I do? Now, I had been uh, in Proverbs, and I would take a proverb for each day. So today is the 17th. I'm reading Proverbs 17 a day. And I just kind of do that. It's been very good to give me wisdom and guidance to help me think differently. You know, I have my way of thinking, and I think I'm pretty smart till I read the Bible. And I'm like, no, you're, you need some work. But I'm on Proverbs 6 that day, and it says, if you have ever made a covenant or you've ever made a surety with a stranger, go to them immediately and ask to get out of it not any interpretation needed. And so I went to the dude and I said, hey, dude, I've made a mistake. I, I don't want to be in a covenant with you. Can I get let out of this thing? And he's like, what, what? And I was like, well, I read Proverbs 6 that if I made a covenant, I can get out if I ask you and you let me out. He's like, sure. So why do I tell you that? Because many people are trying to get a word from God without reading the word. And the word will speak to you enough. It, it doesn't mean that you won't get outside influence and leadings and guidance, but you'll never be able to interpret what God's saying unless you know what he said. I want to be real clear because people are like, I've never heard the voice of God. You will never be able to identify a leading, an impression, a, a moment, an opportunity. You'll never be able to identify it unless you know who he is. Last week I talked to you about hearing and discerning the voice of God. And uh, as I was preparing for this message this week, my wife, uh, we normally call for each other in the house. And, and I heard her voice call for me. And I was like, uh, where are you at? And so I went into the laundry room because that's normally where she is. Come on, y'all been in enough sermons, you know. And you know, I, I, I actually, two weeks ago, I did a lo couple loads of laundry. Like, it was... Husbands, let me tell you something. If you do a chore that you normally don't do that she does, oh, it's a, it'll be a good time. And uh, so I went to the laundry room. I go to the... Uh, no, I went to the, the bathroom next, uh, our, our master bath. And then finally, I went to the closet. And I'm like, oh, there you are. And, and so... I was thrown off trying to find her voice. And I think many times when we talk about hearing the voice of God, we think in a very tangible, concrete way, and we miss what God is speaking to us. We think, Samuel, I need to hear audible voice. We think, well, is it going to be so clear that I can't miss it? And, and I don't think we get the gentle leading of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life to guide you, to direct you, to lead you in His plan and purpose for your life. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And so I want to go in a passage that I think gives us illustration on two foundational elements, two founda although I got three points, but two foundational elements to help you hear and understand and walk out the plan of God for your life. Looking at John the 10th chapter, John the 10th chapter, and I want to say I'm not downtown today, so we're going to go a little later, okay? Amen. Buckle up. We're going to at least 1020, at least 1020. Can I get an amen on that? You're like, Pastor, you went to 1030 last week and you were preaching down there. I got you. I love you. <laughs> Verse 20 says this, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate will get shot in Texas. Sorry, 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 sorry. It's a Texas joke. It's a te if you're visiting out of town, it's a Texas joke. Must surely be a thief and a robber, but the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. And they follow him. Look at your neighbor and say, you follow Jesus. follow Jesus. Follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him. Look at your neighbor and say, run from the stranger. Run from the stranger. 
from him because they don't know. This is not a good time to leave the service right now if you talk to somebody about that. Don't know his voice. All right. So uh, Jesus gives this parable, a little context, gives this parable on the backside of healing someone in John 9, and everybody's saying he's doing this through false means. He's doing this through demonic means. He's a false teacher, false prophet. You shouldn't follow him. So he drops this parable following that healing, and nobody understands. In fact, in the sixth verse, it says nobody's getting what he's saying. So he breaks it down. And in a Christian context, if you've already given your heart to Jesus and you're following him, I don't think you need necessarily the context broken down. He is the gate. He is the one you follow. He's the connection place between you and the Father. His death and resurrection were needed for you to come into relationship with God. You couldn't do it of your own strength. He is a perfect and holy God. You are a sinful person. You needed a cleansing more than tide could do. And when that happened, it didn't leave you just a rotten sinner. It brought you into relationship with God. This is amazing. Now you can hear his voice. Now you can know his voice. But I want to dive into some of the things he said because when I talk to, again, when I talk to people about hearing the voice of God, they think audible. They think he's going to wake me up in the middle of the night like Samuel. I'm going to misinterpret it and think it was the food. But, okay, not a good joke. I, I love the late laughs. That's like a courtesy, like we still love you, Pastor. Not the joke, but we love you. Um, Then your wife gives you the late amen. And uh, <laughs> all right. But I, but I want to go into what I think are two foundational things to allow God to lead you and guide you and for you to follow Him in His plan for your life. And if we see there, it, the first thing I would tell you is the leading of the Lord happens by the Word and the Spirit. The leading of the Lord happens by the Word and the Spirit. A lot of people are like, I've never heard God. I've never heard Him speak to me. I'm like, have you read the text messages in that thing called the Bible? Amen. Important that you're allowing the Word to be a light to you. Um, have you ever uh, been uh, woken up in the middle of the night and man, got to go to the bathroom, but you don't want to turn on the light because you don't want to wake up your spouse and... You stub your toe, like it just, I, we, have, we have, I have some weights that I kind of work, I, you can't tell, but I kind of work out with, <laughs> and, and I have them on the ground, and I stub my toe, and, and then I'm definitely crying out for Jesus, and <laughs> some of y'all have done that. Uh, well, see, what does light do? Light helps you to see obstacles. Light helps you to find direction. Light is important. And guess what the Word of God is called in Scripture? Light. I love this Scripture in Psalms, 105, or Psalms 119, verse 105. It says this, Your Word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Now, this is beautiful because he's saying that the Word of God, the Bible, is not only showing you God's plan for your life, it's not only showing you purpose and potential, it's giving you practical application on how to get there. You know, many people will hear uh, John 29, God has a good plan for you, a plan to prosper you, give you hope in the future, and everybody's like, okay, but yeah, but how do I get there? Like, how do I live that out practically? And God's word will come to you and begin to speak to you. It'll say, you know, you used to, you know, slap somebody if they talked about you, and now it's like, why don't you forgive them instead? Why don't you turn the other cheek? And so you're hearing the word, and while it was a, a different way than you thought it would take you to the direction, that word is changing your mind so that you can think like God thinks. And it gives you practical ways so that you don't stumble in the darkness. When you're driving a car, what are the important lights you need when it's dark, dark outside? Some are like the taillights. That's because you drive too slow. <laughs> you, need, you need the headlights, right, to know where you're going. And it's the same with the Word of God. The Word of God's going to speak to your heart and it's going to give you not only God's plan, but how to get there, when to take this step, how to take this step, when to choose to, to, to love somebody, when to, you know, is this the one I'm supposed to marry or not? And then God's speaking to you, why don't you become somebody that's worth marrying? See, it gets you to even think differently. I remember um, 
uh, there was a minister that came to our, our German English church when I was in Germany. And a uh, prophetic minister played the piano, sang just awesome. He connected with me, and I'm like, wow, the favor of God. And, and he said, why don't you come to my apartment? Let's pray. And so I went over to his apartment. We prayed a little bit, and it was just, a, it was weird. It was like, um, without getting into too many details, it was like taking a shower with your socks on. Just the prayer felt off. I, I couldn't put my finger on why, just felt off. But in the midst of the prayer, he's like, we just need to make a covenant together. And I'm like, I'm young. I'm in my 20s. I'm like, Come, well, I just met you, dude. And, and anyway, I do it. I'm, I'm a little naive. And the next thing I know, I get an email from Susan. She said, hey, I just had a dream about you making a covenant with somebody that's improper. I'm like, whoa. Now you're like, man, I wish I had a personal prophet on the side. I, look, I don't know how that happened. But I'm like, God, what do I do? Now, I had been uh, in Proverbs, and I would take a proverb for each day. So today is the 17th. I'm reading Proverbs 17 today. And I just kind of do that. It's been very good to give me wisdom and guidance to help me think differently because I, you know, I have my way of thinking, and I think I'm pretty smart until I read the Bible. And I'm like, no, you're, you need some work. And, uh, but I'm on Proverbs 6 that day, and it says, if you have ever made a covenant or you've ever made a surety with a stranger... Go to them immediately and ask to get out of it. And I was like, it's like the Lord was just speak. I mean, it was fresh. I didn't have to, I didn't, no, not any interpretation needed. And so I went to the dude and I said, hey, dude, I made a mistake. I, I don't want to be in a covenant with you. Can I get let out of this thing? And he's like, what, what? And I was like, well, I read in Proverbs 6 that if I made a covenant, I can get out if I ask you and you let me out. He's like, sure. And I was like, and here's your shirts back. I don't like those. And uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it was weird. Anyway. So, so why do I tell you that? Because many people are trying to get a word from God without reading the word. And the word will speak to you enough. It doesn't mean that you won't get outside influence and leadings and guidance, but you'll never be able to interpret what God's saying unless you know what he said. Let me, I want to be real clear because people are like, I've never heard the voice of God. You, you, won't ever, you will never be able to identify a leading, an impression, a, a moment, an opportunity. You'll never be able to identify it unless you know who he is. That means you got to be in the Bible. Here's, here's a problem with our lives many times. We are scrolling through social media for hours at a time. We are consuming the news, which... I could go into that because it's just bad, right? They just want to make you mad so you can be on their team, right? That's what they do. I don't care what side it is. Just make them mad enough so they'll vote like I want them to vote, all right? And, oh, I shouldn't have even gone. I did. Oh, and, and we're consuming all of that darkness and only taking in light maybe five minutes a day. Got the devotional done. Listen to KSBJ, they did a devotional for us, that's enough light. And I think we're missing when God's saying stuff to us because we're not in the light enough. It would be, it would be like this, why does it help you identify? If, if let, Let's say that you lived in a foreign country and we were pen pals and I was writing you uh, and, and you loved basketball and that's kind of how we made our connection and I wrote you and I said, I'm a center for the Houston Rockets, right? Like center's... Uh, Y'all know what center? The center is the position that Shaquille O'Neal played. Okay. So I'm writing you. I'm like, hey, I play for the Houston Rockets. And I'm, we're about to go out of town. And every letter that I wrote to you, I started with, I'm a center for the Houston Rockets. I'm about to go out of town. And we did this for like four years. And finally I said, hey, I'm going to come meet you. And I show up to your house. And you see me. You'd be like, you don't play for the NBA. Can I get an amen? <laughs> you would have to, you, now you're going to have to reconcile what was written with what you're experiencing. That's, it's not making sense. Some of y'all don't do basketball. Let me give another example. Y'all ever heard of catfishing? Not noodling. That's what I did when I was in East Texas. I'm talking about where somebody online gives you a fake persona. So, so let's use Marlo and me as an example. So I'm trying to date Marlo. We meet online and I have a picture. My profile picture is Brad Pitt. <laughs> and we communicating back and forth. And, and finally we say, hey, let's go get some coffee. So I go meet her. And she, she can't see me, but I sit down in the thing and I say, hey, I'm, I'm Trey Dowdy. And she's, now she's trying to reconcile this picture she got, right? And she's probably thinking at that moment, she's like, 
man, the Lord just blessed me. I thought you looked like that ugly dude, but you are. A... I worked on that one. All right, so. What am I trying to tell you, though? I'm trying to tell you a principle that Paul writes in Galatian. He says, if I come to you, or you have an angel come to you, a spiritual experience, and they preach something different than the gospel I originally gave to you, they are accursed. So that lets me know that if there's any spiritual experience, there's any opportunity, there's any relationship, and it goes against what he said, then it's not him. And this is where maturity steps in, and this is when you can determine who is actually just trying to live this flaky life and who's in the Word. Because when you're in the Word, you're going to begin to mature, and as you mature, you'll be led by the Spirit. That's why Romans 8 says this, uh, verse 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children, that word there is son, sons of God. Now that word sons in the Greek means this, Mature sons of God. So when you begin to be led by God, you're going to have a maturity. What does it mean by maturity? I love the writer of Hebrews. He says, I got to go back to milk because you guys, you can't handle the meat. Those that are mature can discern what is good and what's bad. And if you're in Netflix all the time, you'll, you'll, you'll run to darkness calling it light because that's the days we're in. I'm preaching good. See, when Paul gives me the amen, I'm going to rock on this thing. <laughs> so there, there's this place where you're learning how to follow him because you're in the word so much. That, consum uh, that consuming of the word, that eating it, that chewing it like a cow. Uh, Y'all know what cows do when they eat cud? They masticate it. That's the word. I heard it in a sermon. I've never forgotten it. They have three stomachs. They, they chew it a little bit, put it in the stomach. They spit it up, chew it again, put it in another stomach. And that's what you're doing. Yeah, it's so, ooh, you're like, yeah, I'm never forgetting that either. <laughs> but that's what you're doing with the word of God. Isn't that what is commanded to Joshua? Meditate in this word day and night. The Hebrew word for meditation is not go, um, that, that, that's Eastern. That'll open you up to a bunch of demons, I'll just be honest with you. The Hebrew word for meditation means to mumble the words of God. That means you continually say it over and over and over again. So I'm driving in traffic and it is, it is spring break time. And somebody cuts me off. And a thought comes to me. You could just ram them right now and say you blacked out. <laughs> yeah, I've never had that thought. Okay. Yeah. Whatever thoughts you get, you just you know, keep it to yourself. And, uh, but instead of running with that thought, the Word of God challenges it and says, I'm patient. The fruit of the Spirit is patient. I, I don't need my own way. I don't need to be self-seeking right? Man, that would change how you're just involved with people if, if you got yourself off your mind. Everybody's going through an issue in life, and you could be the answer to pray for that issue if you'd get yourself off your mind. And so that light's in me, that Word of God's in me, so that I'm ready for those moments that come across, and I'm able to be a mature son to discern what God's saying. Not only that, but in verse 15, he says this, so you have not received this, a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. So that lets me know that any time fear is involved in that thought, it's not God. So when I'm thinking, don't go pray for that person, they'll think you're crazy. They'll, they'll laugh at you. I know that's not a thought of God because God doesn't give me fear. Come on, y'all know that, right? That's why you need to stop watching scary movies. You're letting darkness just infiltrate you. Oh, I'm just I'm ja I'm messing with your your Netflix time. I'm sorry. Uh, instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba. That word Abba just means like we would call in America Daddy. Whatever you whatever as a young kid you called your dad, maybe Papa, whatever. I, I called mine Daddy. That's what that means. Abba, Daddy, Father. Verse sixteen. For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are what. 
God's children. And since we are His children, we are His heirs. In fact, together with, not, not below Christ, He says together with Christ. We are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share His glory, we must also share His suffering. So I want, to, I, want to, I want you to catch this because this is an important aspect in what Jesus talks about in John the 10th chapter. Not only are you following the leading of God by the Word and the Spirit, you are also rooted in the right identity. Many people are, know the Word, they feel like they're following the Spirit, but they've never come to the, the security of being an adopted child of God. And so they operate as an orphan. They operate in a place of abandonment. They, they don't follow the fullness of what God has for them. And so you'll lash out. You'll say, God's speaking to me here, but yet you're, you're angry at this person. You won't forgive this person. And it all comes from an identity that's never been rooted in Christ. Jesus in John 10 says this, I call my sheep by their name. And they know my voice. There's a relational connection that if you don't understand the identity that God's put in your heart, you'll miss it even if you know the word. All right, so in Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, there's also this call by name, and I love it. It says in verse 1, But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who forms you, says, Don't be afraid. For I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Now I love this verse about God calling Israel by name. I think it applies to us. But the first thing he says is, I've called you Jacob. What is he saying there when he starts with Jacob instead of Israel? He's saying to us as believers, I know your weakness. I know your insecurity. I know the sins that you feel like if anybody else knew about, nobody would like you. I know your struggles in life. And yet, I formed you in the midst of all that, and I still want you on my team. Uh, When I was studying for this, the uh, psychologists uh, called this, uh, some people have a relational anxiety. And a relational anxiety means that you'll have intimacy issues. And I don't, I don't mean sexual. I mean you just simply won't get close to people because you feel like if you get close to people, they'll figure out who you are and they won't like what they see. And you didn't even know that at first, they say, that you, the reason you found out that you got some quirks and jacked up and not sure if anybody would really like you is because when you got into a relationship, somebody abused you and somebody called out that, those quirks. Somebody said, oh, no, you're this and that and you're ugly and you're never going to amount to anything. And because of a relationship that you were close to, there, there was this abuse, there was this, this, this struggle, and it always pointed to who you were, your identity, Now, when you get into relationships, you feel like you always got to put a guard up because if they knew who you were, they wouldn't like what they saw. And here's the crazy thing. God knows you better than anyone else is what he's saying. He still wants you, but he wants you so much that he's willing to redeem you. He's willing to take your personality. Now, some things, they're just quirks. They're not sins, right? Like, like if you got to know me, you know I have some flatulence. I think there's a word. And <laughs> at all the wrong times with my wife, right? Like, and she still loves me, I think. Um, it's not a sin, I don't think. Um, somebody's going to show me in the book of Leviticus where it is. And... Uh, but I got quirks, I got bad jokes, and my wife still laughs, right? And, and here's the crazy thing. You got quirks about you, but he also doesn't, he, he loves the quirks, but he redeems you from the sin. See, Trey was very narcissistic. Trey was very self-seeking, and Trey was about himself. And if you really get down to the root of who you are, you were too. And you needed a savior. You needed redemption. You needed somebody that said, you know what? I want to cleanse you from your sinful behavior and your selfishness. And I want to bring you on your team. And and you used to have the identity of Jacob that was a schemer, that was out to get it for himself. But I want to take you to promise Israel. 
And that's what God does with us. He doesn't just redeem us. He doesn't just cleanse us off. But he puts you on a place of potential and promise. This is amazing. This is the identity you have in Christ. And if you don't operate in that identity, you can hear things and miss God because you don't know who you are. Y'all are like, you got to tell some stories, Pastor. You're not helping me. Well, let's, let's talk with a story out of the Scriptures. There's a guy named Peter, right? Y'all know about Peter in the Scripture? Peter has a quirk. We could even maybe say it stumbles into sin a lot of times. He has a, a disease called foot and mouth disease. Y'all know, y'all have ever read the scriptures. You know, Peter suffers with foot and mouth disease more than anybody else. And it's pointed out. In fact, there's, there's one time they have the Mount of Transfiguration, right? And you got Jesus shining like a light bulb with Moses and Elijah right there. I mean, this is a spiritual moment. This is crazy. And Peter decides to jump into the conversation. Jesus, I got an idea. We need to build for you a lot. We need to build. And, and, and God, the Father says, shut up, Peter. I'm paraphrasing. But he says, this is my son. Listen to him. That's what he says, right? Because Peter, every time, had a quirk that stumbled in the city. He had a weakness. And here's the thing. God didn't need to change his weakness. He just needed to redeem it. See, here's a problem with a lot of us. We think we got to work on our weakness. You don't need to work on it. You just need to give it over and surrender to God. I'm preaching better than you saying amen today. We're taught we got to work on our weakness. Get it better. Get a better strength in there. No, this is what Paul said. He said, when I am weak, he is strong. You have to come to a place where you give your weakness over to God. And that's what happens with Peter. God says, I can use that guy to lead my church. I just need to redeem it. And my question is, have you discovered the redemptive power of God that changes your identity? It changes how you now see yourself. I'm not looking in the mirror and saying I'm sin waiting to happen. I see myself as the righteousness of God now in Christ Jesus. You're saying, Pastor, you don't sin? I'm saying I don't think with that mentality. I'm saying my thought process has to change. Now, when I do sin, for those that still are struggling with that, when I do sin, I ask for forgiveness. I make it right where I can. Now, I'm talking to the Father. I'm allowing Him to restore me and gently bring me back into the kingdom. But, but my friends, it's, um, you'll never rise to the level of righteousness that He's paid for until you believe it. And it's not just living. I'm going to say it again, but in another way. It's not just... I love it. I love a talk back church. Keep going. It's not simply just living out the gospel. It's understanding who you are so that you can become all he created. I'll give you an example of this. We have uh, Jesus talks about a prodigal son. Prodigal simply means wasteful son. And this guy comes to his dad. He says, I want my part of the inheritance right now. And I don't know if you know the story. He takes this money and he goes in, lives in a wild living. He says he goes to a foreign Gentile country. So he probably went to Austin, Texas. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm preaching good. Now, Austin will be redeemed, amen. And, uh, but he, 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 he spends it on crazy living. And he gets down on his money, down on his luck. He's working now on a pig farm. Jewish boys don't do that. That would be like a, a, a Texan um, going to Oklahoma. That's a good one. That's a really good one with Pastor D over there. Yeah, you did it good, dude. Anyway. So, so he's down, but it says he comes to a census, and he says, it was better for me in my father's house. I'll just go work for dad. So he goes back to go tell dad, I'm just going to work for him. And dad sees him from a distance, runs to him, says, wow, my son's here, gives him the ring, signifying authority, gives him the robe, signifying that you're right with God, gives him sandals, signifying that you have now peace with God because of what Jesus did. He says, we're going to kill the fatty calf. We're throwing a party tonight. My son who was dead is now alive. Who was lost is now found. Call up Domino's. We rocking it, right? <laughs> so they're throwing a party. Now, I need you to catch something about this prodigal son. The prodigal son initially thought that his identity 
was rooted in his possessions. His identity, maybe even greater, was rooted in him making a name for himself outside of his father's house. See, I, I don't know where you are in your identity. I don't know if your identity is wrapped up in what you drive. It's definitely not in mine because I drive a minivan. But I don't... <laughs> Come on, you can't be cool driving one. Let's be honest, all right? I, I don't know if it's wrapped up in your family. I don't know if it's wrapped up in your job. I don't know if it's wrapped up in you being single and one, wanting one day to get married and that'll complete you, right? I don't know where your identity is wrapped up, but what we learn from this prodigal son is... That if your identity is wrapped up in possessions or trying to make a name for yourself or trying to achieve something, you'll miss it because the only identity you can have is through relationship with God. Then we have a dude that had a great time. Like he was working for dad. He's awesome. And yet when the party's thrown, he gets upset. He won't even go into the party. I mean, at least grab a pizza and walk out. Like, come on. And, and so dad has to send servants. Dad finally comes out. He says, why don't you come to the party? He says, dad, I've been working for you this whole time. You never threw a party for me. What's that about? And dad says, look, your son or your brother who was lost is now found. Like this is an amazing moment. And, and then he goes on to say, and the fatty, you could have had the fatty calf at any point because all that I have is yours. Now, that gets church attending people to think about it a second, which is you, which is you today. Meaning that I can have a relationship with God where I'm just working for dad without getting his heart. And how is that revealed? What, how is my kindness? How is my mercy? How do I treat those that I don't think deserve it? And the only way you can have a merciful attitude is you realize I didn't deserve it either. This is, my friends, this is crucial you get because if you operate outside of a rooted identity, meaning I'm found in Christ, He's the reason I live, He sustains me, I'm a child of Him, He's made me right, I don't have to earn anything, He's already done it all for me, and I can live now in freedom and, and have a great time in Dad and work for Dad, but not because I'm trying to prove anything, because I'm already accepted. If you don't have all of that in your identity, you'll have leadings and guidings and opportunities, and you'll pursue out of a wrong motive this opportunity thinking it's God, but then find out when the fruit of it comes to fruition, that fruit of it comes to fruition. I won't say that at the 11. Um, it's just the preaching in me coming at side notes. But, but when, all, when, when wisdom is justified by our children or what's birthed from that decision comes forth and it doesn't seem like God, you'll go back saying, I missed it because your identity has never been rooted. This is crucial you get. This is, this is foundational for hearing from God is that you discover you're a child of God. Most people that say, I've never heard from God, struggle with identity. But when you realize He loves you and He's called you an heir, a joint heir with Christ, it begins to shift how you just walk this earth. And you're like, Daddy's going to speak to me because I, I need Him to speak to me. Daddy's never not spoken to me. You catching that? And as you do that, then the stranger's voice will seem strange. My third point. Now, y'all got the two foundations, right? You're being led by God through the Word and the Spirit, and you have a rooted identity. My third point, you got to stop flirting with the stranger. You need to flee from them. we got a lot of people flirting with the world, flirting with, well, I can do a little bit of this and still love Jesus. My friends, you, you can't love the world and love God. Are we key on that? So how do we identify that stranger's voice? We get two examples in Scripture that I think are very profound. I love the first example. It would be in the Garden of Eden. When Satan comes and he says to Eve, did God really say? So what does Satan do? What does the stranger's voice sound like? It sounds like things that doubt what God said in His Word. He challenges it. So you'll let, let me make it even real plain because I think I've, I've gone too uh, 
I haven't gotten into practical. Let me make it real pr- practical. So you go to the doctor. You get a bad report from the doctor. We, we just heard Kathy's testimony on that, right? Instead of, I'm going to believe that word. Now, I'm not saying that you don't get help and, and allow God to do what God can do through the doctors. But what I am saying, instead of allowing fear to grab your heart, you believe what God said, which is by His stripes I am healed. And you're rooted on identity where you're like, I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to go on it. Now, if God asks you to go on a 40-day fast, do it. But you're not doing it to get a healing because he already paid for it. Yeah. We, are we, we, amen. Amen. Are we catching what, what, I'm, what I'm spitting out here today? Yeah. Right? He's going to attack the word of God. He slides in and he always is asking, did God really say that? When I go out to, to pray for people, and, and I'm like, oh, maybe not that one, right? I, uh, a fear, it's because a fear came into me, and I agreed with the stranger's voice that they're going to reject me, or nothing's going to happen. Y'all never had that, right? Or I'm too busy to reach this person right now, right? All of those fearful, doubtful, challenging what? The Word of God, because it's the Word of God that leads you. What was the other challenge we had in Scripture where he goes to Jesus and he says this, if you are the Son of God. What was he challenging there? Identity. So he's going to challenge what I told, what I told you leads you. The Word of God or he's going to challenge your identity. Are you really the Son of God? Then you need to prove it. That's what he told Jesus. Now how did Jesus combat that? His way of fleeing was it is is written. Y'all catching all this? So what will happen is, you'll start getting thoughts. We all get thoughts. And not every thought is your thought. You need to start, just recognize that. Just because you get a thought doesn't mean it's your thought. And, And let me add on to that. This is an organ. Your brain is an organ. Let me make it even more plain. Maybe this will help. It's like a computer program. What you put in is going to come out. Y'all got silent up in me on this church. We were going. I didn't tell enough stories. The back part, I should have told more stories. That's all right. Oh, no, no. It's 1020, and this is the 9 a.m., and you're like, how much longer is this dude going to go? That's what y'all are asking. I know why some of y'all come to the 9. I got. I know. I know. I'm like, we're always jam-packed at the nine. And it's like, yeah, because you're done in an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, all right. So, so you flee, you flee with the word of God. You flee from it. You don't flirt with it. And here's the problem. A lot of us have been flirting with the stranger instead of fleeing from the stranger. So not every thought's your thought. You can train your brain. I think some of us need to realize that. I, I think mental anxiety is because we stopped training our brains and we started just doing this. Wait, let me make it really plain. I need another dopamine hit. Why is life so boring? I'm preaching good. Y'all may not give me an amen, but that's good. And to heal all mental anxiety right now. So, not all. Let me so absolute with your statements, Pastor. All right. So I'll give you one last uh, story leading a God, and we, we will roll out of here. Y'all okay with that? Yeah. Amen. Good. Um, so, again, I'm, it's not always concrete, not always audible voice. You're not always going to have a prophet call you and say, hey, this happened, right? But God will lead you through opportunities, moments. I remember when God was speaking to me about a big direction change for my life. When he spoke to me, he said, I want you to go into ministry. Now, this is before calling me even to this church. Like, I want you to go into ministry. And, and so I'm, I'm listening to a sermon, and the pastor preaches about Cortez coming to the New Americas and burning the boats so that they couldn't go back. Now, I don't know if that's historically accurate or not. I don't know. I just heard him give that example, and the Lord said... When it's your time to step out in ministry, I'm going to need you to burn the boats. I just heard that. And so I, you know, it, it, I'm coming to the end of my military career and, and I'm feeling the Lord lead me. And there's an opportunity open for me. Now, I feel called to preach. 
In fact, I thought I was a really good preacher until I actually started doing it. That's a whole nother, that's another sermon. But, but I feel called to preach, and the opportunity available for me was an accountant position in youth ministry. I'm like, Lord, this is, is this ministry? Like, what? And not only that, they weren't going to pay me. I had to go back to America and raise the funds. So the money ain't there. I'm struggling. I, I look at even trying to raise the funds. I would be making a third of what I was in the army. So huge jump down and pay. But that's all right. I'm going to get married and Marlo help with the budget. And uh, <laughs> I've been my sugar mama. And uh, <laughs> all right. Now, why am I telling you all that? Because it didn't seem like the wind was with me. It didn't seem like a great opportunity. Does that make sense? Financially, it's not making sense in my brain. But I, I have this leading, this impression. It's, it's very subjective. I don't know if you could take the scientific method and make it work, but I just have this leading. It's not the greatest opportunity. I mean, I'm not even preaching, God. That's what I, I think you called me to. But I'm, I start this process, and as I do with the military, I, um, not renounce, uh, I think it was, I went through extra paperwork to resign my commission. So I couldn't even get back in if I wanted to, which I needed because when I wasn't making that much money, I was like, man, it was so much better in the army. They paid for my housing, and I could just go out to eat whenever I wanted to. And, but I resigned my commission. It was necessary. Because when I got in the thick of it and I started questioning, did I hear God? That small step there helped me stay with it. I burned the boats. Then I'm there and I'm... I'm let, can I keep going with this story a little bit more? I'm just talking about how God leads you. Again, I didn't get an audible voice. God's never come to me and said, I've called you to preach, right? You know, I, I, I wish. That would have been cool. But then I would have kind of still questioned it after I came off a bad sermon, right? Because you got to have a rooted identity. Not performance-based. So I'm, 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 I'm following God. I've done youth ministry for about two years. Then my grandfather calls me and says, Hey, uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, You're supposed to come pastor this church. And I told Paul, Paul, I said, Well, the Lord needs to talk to me. <laughs> and Paul, Paul said this. Paul, Paul said, Well, he's already spoken to me and you're coming. So you need to get on board. But as this is happening, God begins to open other opportunities. I got three other opportunities that year where people said, hey, we would love, one was to be a young adult pastor, two others were to be senior pastors for very small churches. And what was God doing? He was trying to show me that the calling was being recognized on me wasn't just because I was the grandson of a pastor, but that God was, God was showing other ministers that that calling was on my life. But that wasn't enough for me. I said, God, if you're calling me to this, me and my wife are one, you're going to need to speak to her. Because if you don't know about this, about my wife, when I went into ministry, I kind of was coat and telling her. She would, was, was already in ministry uh, four years, very successful, very well known as a youth minister, doing, doing exceptional. And here comes tag along Trey. I mean, I'm serious. This is how it worked. And, you know. You're like, it hadn't changed. I got you. Uh, <laughs> but I get, to the, I, uh, I get to this point, and I said, God, you got to speak to my wife. And my wife had a tree in Germany that she called her ministry tree, because in Germany, you got to see the seasons. You got to see fall, spring. Every, you know, in Texas, we got hot and hotter. Like, you got all the seasons. And she just said, this is, the seasons change. Well, one day driving home, they had cut down that tree. And she said, yep, it's time for us now to go to Galveston. Wow. I was excited about it. Um, and so I, I just tell you that because, again, it wasn't some, everybody tells me, I haven't heard the Lord. We never got an audible voice. We got very subjective things, but we were following close to him in his word so much. We were rooted in who he called us to be that we were able to interpret some of the signs that he was showing us. Does that make sense? And some people may not understand it. Some people will definitely call you weird. You're hearing from God, right? But He'll lead you on the path of life if you learn how to follow Him. We all bow our heads together today. 
You know, I never want to close a service without giving you an opportunity to know Jesus. I talked about following the Lord, but it first starts with the gate. And that gate, His name is Jesus. He made a way so that you can have relationship with God. Have peace with God. Are you tired of living for self? Has sin got you down? I want to tell you there's a God that can break every addiction, can transform your life. He has called you to redeem you. That's you today. You want to say yes to Jesus for a first time. Or maybe you want to rededicate your life. You know, I'm the grandson of a pastor. I gave my heart to the Lord at a young age. But through a series of disappointments, I strayed away from God. And I remember in 2001, when my dad invited me back to church, I went and I rededicated my life to God. Never to be the same again. I wasn't perfect, but the perfect one came to live inside me. That's you today. You want to say yes to God for a first time or you want to rededicate your life today. Just raise your hand high in the air. I want to pray with you today. Amen. Yeah, see those hands. Day of new beginnings. Day of a fresh start. A day where the old is gone. And he says, you are my child. You are with me. Father, you see all those hands lifted up towards you. God, we just ask that you would forgive us of our sins. Wash us clean in the blood of Jesus. Break every addiction. Jesus, we believe you died on the cross and rose again. And you're seated at the right hand of the Father. And God, you're more than a God. You're now our Father. Teach us and guide us. Holy Spirit, fill us. In Jesus' name I pray. And the people of God said, you can say these words with me. Say, Jesus is Lord. I believe with that simple prayer and confession, you are brand new in the kingdom of God. Old things have passed away. All things are new. I want to give you two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God. Amen.